So what am I going to try to cover in the roughly three hours that I have? So I'll introduce the statistical theory, statistical learning theory framework. And I should add that there's sort of, the, I find the distinction between computational learning theory and statistical learning theory kind of artificial and really they should all be seen as one whole topic. Uh, so we will make connections to lots of things that you probably did see earlier this morning. Um, so I'll, in particular, I'll also talk about capacity measures of classes of functions. So VC dimension is one of them. And I'll focus mainly on Radomacher complexity, which gives a different way of sort of saying what we can say about the actual error your classifier achieves, not on the training sample that you actually observe, but on data that you haven't seen before. Uh, and this is through uniform convergence results for uh, if you can bound the rather macro complexity of certain classes of functions. Uh, this is not really going to be any much about machine learning, so uh, I'm guessing that doesn't disappoint most people in this room, but that's, that's fine. And, but I will talk about a few machine learning methods now and then just to try and put everything in context and try and give a sense of why we are actually uh, talking about these notions in the first place. And towards the end, if I get time, I'll talk about a different notion of trying to prove generalization bounds, which is through algorithmic stability rather than capacity measures and classes of functions. Okay. I should add that um, so machine learning is a subject that's full of jargon, and I've tried to keep it low, but I might say something that is, to me seems obvious, but if you haven't seen it before, it would make no sense. So please interrupt me and ask me. That would make it much easier. So, so if anything is unclear, just stop me and ask me while I'm talking. OK, so here's sort of the outline of what we'll cover. So let me start straight away with the framework that we're going to look at. And this should seem familiar with what you've seen this morning. So we'll think of having an instance space. So think of this as where all our data is going to lie, at least the input part of the data. So this is images, documents, whatever you want to think of your data as. And, and we're going to think of this as being a subset, some subset of some uh, Rn for some n. And there's also labels associated with the data. And in that sense, this is going to be supervised learning. So we get to see the inputs as well as the data. And so this set of target values will denote by y. And so the two special cases, which mainly will cover what we need to, is when y is just a set minus 1, 1, which is binary classification. It doesn't really matter whether it's 0, 1, or minus 1, 1. It's a bit more convenient to do the mathematics with minus 1, 1. And where y just being the real numbers is what we think of as regression problems. Okay, okay so I'm going to think of data being generated as according to some unknown joint distribution over the set x and y, or x times y, the cross product. And it will sometimes be convenient to factorize this joint distribution as a distribution only on x and then the conditional distribution of y given x. Okay, so this we'll use this. And, but beyond that, we're going to make no assumptions on how y and x relate to each other. So, so there is some joint distribution on this space of inputs and labels or targets. And we get data from this distribution. And so this is what's sometimes called as the agnostic setting. So all of those are references to papers that introduce these settings. So the original one really goes back to Vapnik and Sherman Enkis in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, so there's going to be no specific functional relationship assumed between the observed targets and the actual labels. And so, you know, so we'll have to be a bit precise in how we even define the meaning of learning in this kind of a situation. OK, so here's our setting. So, so how can we fit you know, some, something to this data? And sort of the classical approach, you know, maybe pre-1960s or, or so, uh, pre-1960s, pre-1970s has been, well, you get some data and you try to fit from some you know, fairly general approximation uh, um, classes. So, so you can think of fitting polynomials or trigonometry polynomials. And these are universal in the sense that they can approximate any continuous function under some right conditions. And, and this kind of method of estimation, if you do it carefully, works fairly well for univariate or maybe if, if the data is, has a small number of dimensions. But this, uh, these approaches break down completely if you want to have high dimensional, if you have high dimensional data. And, and this is because the space of functions just explodes. And even though you might fit the data that you have perfectly with maybe even not that complex polynomials and so on, and they will actually not do, tell you anything about data that you've not seen. It's, 
And this is what's sometimes called a scarce of dimensionality. So this is also sort of an overuse term. So there's lots of things that are understood by curse of dimensionality. To different people, it means slightly different things. But the general idea is that things get complicated in high dimensions, and what we're used to in sort of one nice one-dimensional settings no longer works. Right. right so, so this is this becomes a problem. And so this notion is called as overfitting in machine learning. So if you can fit some function to the data that you actually have, but it's not going to help you make any predictions on or very bad predictions possibly on data that you haven't seen yet so far, then you would say what um, you've overfitted to the data, to the observations. And in order to avoid this problem, we're not going to try and fit arbitrary functions, but we are going to restrict the kinds of functions that our algorithm is actually allowed to choose from. So, so we'll think of function classes that have some fixed notion of complexity or capacity, and I've put this in quotes right now because I mean them not in a very precise sense, but we'll try to make precise what complexity or capacity we talk about when we're going to actually look at learning algorithms. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to do, and that will allow us to make, res to make se sentences or statements of the form that show that you, know, you're, you can fit some function that's not going to perform much worse on data that you haven't seen compared to what you see on the data that you have seen. Right? And so this difference is what is called a generalization error. And this is what this is mainly going to focus on, bounding this quantity. So we're not directly asking for minimizing the training error. So if your function class is very, very simple, you might have a very bad training error. But at least what you see on the data that you have will be exactly what you expect for data that you haven't yet seen, as long as it comes from the same distribution. So that's sort of the focus of this. Theory is really understanding how to bound the generalization error. Okay, okay so I'll make a few asides and make connections to sort of machine learning that some of you might have seen before. And so, so what is sort of more common in classical statistics of machine learning is not this agnostic framework, but to try and make explicit probabilistic models of the data. So you will either model the both the distributions on the data itself, on the inputs, and the conditional distributions, or sometimes you only model the conditional distributions. And this is sort of, these, there are names given to this, so this is what's called a generative modeling. So generative modeling is when you try to model the entire joint distribution on both the inputs and the outputs. And this gives rise to methods like Gaussian discriminant analysis, naive Bayes, and, and many other models. Um, the discriminative modeling, which is a little bit more um, closer to what we are going to do, but still we're not going to try to make any probabilistic models at all in on this sense. It only tries to model the conditional distribution of the target given the input. So there's no assumption on what the input really comes from, but condition on the input, you want to make an assumption on how the labels are distributed. And again, sort of the classic examples are linear regression, where you would, you know, so this is just one way you could model linear regression. There's many ways you could do it, is to say that the observed value conditioned on the model parameters and the input is going to be some linear function plus Gaussian noise. Right? So this is the standard modeling assumption. Or if you were doing classification problems, again, you will say that you know, the, the observed label is, you, know, you pass, you have a linear function, you pass it through some sigmoid, so that you can convert it to a probability, and then you're just going to say this is the Bernoulli distribution with that parameter will actually give you the observed label. So this is what sort of classically machine learning or statistics has made models for the data. And this morning you probably saw what's in, in the PAC framework in the so-called realizable setting, where there's an explicit functional dependency assumed in fact. So you assume that the target is just a function of, of the input, and in fact this function is is restricted to be from a certain class. And in that case, it's the VC dimension of this class that controls exactly learnability from data. Okay, so you probably saw a proof of this result this morning. And so this is, this is the connections to things that we might have already seen. Okay, so let's go back to the more general framework. So I'm going to think of, consider f to be some class of functions from x to y. And a learning algorithm is always going to output some function from this function class f. So, so we're no longer restricting f and the y, the targets, to be Boolean. So we have to define cost functions suitably. And so I'll say a cost function is simply a function from y cross y to the non-negative reals. And 
you know, so again, we can look at our familiar examples. So if, if, the, if we are actually trying to solve a Boolean, a Boolean function problem or a class binary classification problem, we can simply define the cost to be the indicator function. So if the labels match, there's no cost. Otherwise, there's a cost of one. In regression, you can use something like y prime minus y, absolute value to the power p. So if p is two, that would be the familiar squared loss, but you can use other values of p as well. And there's many other loss functions or cost functions that you can construct. And indeed, there is a staggering variety of functions that are actually used for various purposes. Right, so, so call the loss of a function f in, in this class f as just if you apply f of x, look at the cost that you get. So f of x is going to be the prediction made by this function. And the main uh, notion that we want to look at is what's called as risk. And this is just the expected loss of the function on the data drawn from this distribution. So this, all of this data is coming from some distribution. And we're just simply looking at the expected loss of this function if we use that function to make predictions under this distribution. And that's what we would call as a risk. Okay. I'm not exactly sure where the word risk comes from, but that's what is commonly called. Okay. Okay, so that's a notion of risk. And of course, we would like to find a function that minimizes the risk. Um, the trouble is, of course, that um, even calculating the risk is, is basically impossible on most interesting problems because you have some high dimensional distribution, but you don't really have access to this distribution. It can, the distribution can be arbitrarily nasty. We're making no assumptions about it. So minimizing is, of course, very hard, but even calculating the risk is, is hard, and essentially the only access we have to this distribution is through samples drawn from this distribution. And this is what we are going to focus on. So I'm going to, throughout this talk, I'll think of a sample S of size M being drawn from, uh, from this distribution, which is, which is IID. So they're all independent and all drawn from the same distribution D. Right? And this is somewhat of a simplifying assumption for many things that will in, in, for data and practice, but this is what we will use to actually develop a theory. And a learning algorithm is simply um, a map that takes any subset of this space uh, x cross y, and it gives a function in f. So that's our learning algorithm. It could be randomized. So given any sample, it outputs some function in this, in this class of functions. And the goal we would like to have is that we want to guarantee the learning algorithm with high probability over the sample drawn from this distribution. If f hat is the, this is the function that the learning algorithm outputs, then the risk of f hat is as close to the best possible risk. So this is the, these are the kinds of guarantees that we would like to make. Right? So that's, that's our ultimate goal. And, and the, this talk will focus on tools that will allow us to prove these kinds of results for certain classes. Okay, so this is um, to an example. So, what is, so what's the first thing that we can think of? Well, you know, our only access to the data is through a sample, so we can try to look at the risk on the sample. And so they can define this simply as the average of the loss on the sample, or average of the cost on the sample if you make predictions using f. So this is what we'll call as empirical risk. Um, the idea is going to be simply to minimize, to find a function that minimizes the empirical risk. Right, so this is what's called as the ERM principle, or the empirical risk minimization principle. And so you can try to find a function that minimizes the risk on the sample we have. And we maybe briefly make a slight couple of points. So we, we're mainly going to focus on statistical questions around the, doing empirical risk minimization. So the question is, if we could do empirical risk minimization, is this a good, is this a good output function in the class? Uh, computationally, uh, in fact, for almost any problem of interest, this is very hard. So they're NP-hard in most instances, possibly worse. Um, so for example, if, you want to f if I give you data like this, and there's a binary classification problem, and I ask you to find a linear separator that minimizes the number of disagreements, can you do it? Okay, so maybe on this data possibly, but in general it's, it's NP-hard, so we can't really solve this problem. Um, on the other hand, if, if there's a promise somehow that this data is 
there is a linear separator that actually separates all the positives from the negatives. So that's not at all guaranteed by the assumptions I've made so far, but if we were given such a promise, and then the problem is actually easy. So can anyone see how to do it? <laughs> Have you seen? Well, not, not on this case, but in general. It's just, it's just linear programming, actually. So you just find something that satisfies all the points on the correct side. So you can just write a linear program and it solves this, right? So, so under this promise, this problem is easy, but without such a promise, actually minimizing the risk is, is NP hard. And in fact, for most problems, we care to solve minimizing the empirical risk is going to be NP hard. So, so this is really understanding the statistics of this, not computational aspects. Yes. So if we know that there exists just a parameter, then we need to find it. Yes. But it has to have no error. So even if it is an epsilon error, that's still already hard. So this. Okay. So this is um, uh, what's called this. Uh, so we're going to focus on empirical risk minimization for for a little bit. So how do we guarantee that the actual risk is close to optimal if we actually just find something that has a small, the smallest possible risk on the sample we we have? And so let's focus on classification for, for a second, and then you've already seen how to do this for in this morning. So suppose you're looking at um, binary class, uh, Boolean functions as a binary classification problem, and the class of functions that we're looking at has finite VC dimension, and we're simply looking at the cost. The, well, for, for Boolean inputs or for binary classification, there's only really one meaningful cost function. You can't really define more than one meaningful cost function. And a result which is basically something along the lines of what is slightly different because you probably only saw a version of this where the data is guaranteed to be generated according to some function in this class. But even if it is not, there's a result using the VC dimension that allows us to prove a result like this, which tells us that the risk of, for any function, so if we have a sample that's of size m drawn in IID from this distribution, and for any delta, with probability at least one minus delta for every function in this class, the actual risk, the true risk, so the one without the hat is always going to be the true risk, can be bounded by the risk on the sample, plus some terms like the ones there. But the thing to note is that, of course, you have m in the denominator and both of these things under the square root. So as, as your sample size increases, so as in particular once m is larger than the VC dimension, then you're going to get non-trivial bounds out of this, and actually you guarantee that your, your actual risk will be close to the empirical risk. And this is the case for every, every function in this class. Right? And this allows you to prove that actually empirical risk minimization is a good strategy. Okay. Right, so how do you finish the argument there? So let's, uh, so let's suppose uh, that F star is the minimizer of the true risk. So I'm, it's in quotes because, in general, there's, you can't guarantee that there is um, the minimizer defined, but maybe we can only get arbitrarily close to the infimum. But let's say we have a true minimizer, and f hat is the minimizer of the empirical risk. Then we can write a couple of lines, basically, so saying that the risk of um, the actual risk of the output of our classifier is close to the empirical risks using this theorem. Um, this is, of course, on the sample. What algorithm outputs is better than f star because algorithm chose something that minimized the empirical risk on the sample. Um, but this is also close to its true risk. Uh, so we can use the flip version of this theorem, so they set this in a one-sided version. But actually, the theorem guarantees that the absolute value of the difference between the true risk and the empirical risk is small. So if we flip this around, then we can get that this is at most epsilon, which means that the risk of the, uh, the function output by the algorithm is going to be close to the best possible risk. And this is so this, is, so this argument is what we're going to always use. So once we can get a bound like this, which shows that the true risk and the empirical risk are close to each other, then we, have, we know that doing empirical risk minimization is enough. OK. So uh, let's me move on to a slightly different question. So so far, uh, I, I said that let f be a class of functions. and. You know, we, I didn't really say, and you didn't exactly challenge me to why, well, what is f and why should one use f? Um, but it's a valid question. So what f should we use? And, and so, you know, so there's a trade-off there if we look at this kind of a, this result. So 
So we want to minimize the empirical risk, and ideally we would like the empirical risk to be small, because if, if our function has a large error on the training set, then maybe it doesn't have a very high generalization error, but it's not very useful because it's going to have high error nevertheless. So we do want to minimize error on the training set or the empirical risk, um, but we don't want to do it at the cost of having a very large term in the bound there. And so that's the trade-off, right? And so this is, so if you have a very large class of functions, then the terms on the right can get large. Uh, but if we use function classes that are very small, then it may not be possible to get a small enough empirical risk. And so maybe learning is not very useful. And that's, uh, that's really the trade-off between complexity of the kind of functions you're fitting and then in the sense of the generalization ability and the ability to actually fit data. In statistics, this is sometimes referred to as the bias variance trade-off, so it's the sense of the same kind of thing. And so should we pick a more cl complex class of functions? The more complex class of functions means that we can achieve smaller empirical risk, but at the risk of having the difference between the true risk and empirical risk growing larger. And so there is a way around this, or in principle there's a way around this, which is called the structural risk minimization. And so the, what we should do is not just choose a single family of functions, but an infinite family of functions indexed by some complexity measure. So D I'm going to think of here as a complexity measure, so think of it as the VC dimension, but it can be other kinds of complexity measure as well. And what you want to do is not just something that minimizes the empirical risk, but the empirical risk plus an additional penalty term, which depends on the complexity of the classifier that you have, or the capacity measure of the class of functions that you're using, and the amount of data that you have. So M is the number of data samples that you have. So you can imagine putting the term on the right there. Does this work, actually? Okay. Maybe not. Ah, never mind. All right. So, so the term on the right there is so the middle one, really. That's the relevant term, because that's the one that has D. So you can imagine it adding a term like that to kappa there and that's going to determine the penalty. Right. And again, if you've seen sort of more applied machine learning, this is reminiscent of what you would actually typically do, which is you, know, you would not just minimize the empirical risk, but add something that's usually called regularizer, uh, regularizer in machine learning, which is something that penalizes the complexity of, of the function that you're learning. So typically, this would be the sum of the squares of all the weights that are the parameters in, in the model you're trying to fit, or the sum of the absolute values of the weights, or some other such term. And so this is, you know, this is really coming from the same principle, that you want to have a term that penalizes the complexity, and not just the error. Why is the complex model favored? Disfavored. Disfavored. So there's a term there that depends on D and M. Right, so the square root of D over M. In general, you'll always have a term there. So D reflects the complexity of the model. So it means that the, the gap, the best bound you can get, or some bound that you can get on the, on the gap between the true risk and the empirical risk is controlled by that. So if D gets very large, then you can't say very much about the difference between those risks. So what you really care is having the true risk being small, not the empirical risk. This is, why, this is how complexity plays a role there. Is that, okay, any other questions? Okay, so let me sort of may try and make all of this more concrete by looking at an incredibly simple uh, model. So, so going back to linear regression. So what's linear regression? So we're simply looking, saying that f, the class of functions that we're fitting, is just a set of linear functions. So W is some vector in Rn, uh, comes from some set of vectors, and the linear function simply maps x to W dot x, so it's a linear function. Uh, you can have an extra constant term, but it doesn't really change almost anything, so I'm not going to add the constant term in most of these things. Uh, we'll consider the squared loss as the error, so if the model predicts something y, pr uh, y prime, and the actual target is y, then the cost is given by y prime minus y squared, and D is some distribution over, some arbitrary joint distribution over um, x cross y. So I'm going to define g of x simply to be the expectation of y given x. 
Okay, so this is uh, the X there should be bold. Sorry. Um, so okay, so this need not be a linear function by itself, but let's define this function. And now let's define any other function h, which is from x to r, and try and understand what the risk of h would be. So, so far, I'm not saying anything about g and h being linear. So the risk of h is simply the, this quantity here, which is the expectation of hx minus y squared, where x and y are drawn from the distribution. And we can write it like this. And by adding gx in between, and there's, there's of course, an extra cross term. But because gx is defined to be that, which is the expectation of y given x, this cross term is actually just 0. Because if you take the expectation with respect to y in the cross term, then you just get 0. And so what you really have is, is this quantity here. So for any function h, this, its risk is given by this quantity here. The first term is always non-negative because it's an expectation of a square term plus the risk of g. So what this tells you is that the best possible thing that you can do if you want to minimize the squared loss is simply to use the function gx, which is the expectation of y given x. Okay. You, can, you cannot do better than that on, if, on arbitrary data. So, so if g were indeed in f, so if g itself were a linear function, this is what we would refer to as a realizable setting. So, so we don't have to say that uh, the data is ex y is exactly a linear function of x, but as long as the expectation of y given x is a linear function, we will still call it a realizable setting. And that's what it would be in. And we're not really going to make that assumption, but I just wanted to make the connection between the two. So, so in some sense, that's the best possible risk we can hope for. And that's, that's just down to the noise. So y can be noisy, and the r of g there, so the risk of g rep simply represents the noise level which we absolutely cannot beat. Okay. okay, so again, maybe I'll make a quick aside to make a few connections to machine learning. So, so this is you know, a very standard discriminative model in, in machine learning, which is to model y for linear regression, y given w and x as being just linear function w dot x plus Gaussian noise. and. And what's commonly done is to look at the likelihood of observing the data under this model. So if you assume that the data really does come from a linear model of this kind, then for any set of parameters w and x1 through xm as inputs, you can write, the, or at least write something that's proportional to the density of observing y1 to ym under this model. Which in this case, it's easy to write because you just have to write the density function of a Gaussian distribution. And if you look at this and looking at the log of this function is slightly easier. So if you look at what's called the log likelihood, then you get this first term that doesn't depend at all on w minus some term that's sum of the squares that we actually w w care about. Right? And so there's also this connection that if you do make a probabilistic model of this kind where you think of the target being generated as a linear model plus Gaussian noise, then, then it's actually the maximum likelihood estimator of the model parameters is exactly the one that minimizes squared loss. And so this is you know, one of the reasons why squared error was, was used, because it's, it's common to assume that the noise is Gaussian. And this, this is what this is the method of least squares, and this goes back at least 200 years, I think, to Laplace or Gauss. So this is a very old machine learning model indeed. So, so we want to solve this problem and go back to our statistical learning theory framework so, so we think of some family of linear functions. Think of k as just being a set of vectors with norm bounded by capital W. And you can write the empirical risk minimizer, and we can try to find the empirical risk minimizer for this particular loss. And the question is, how do we argue about generalization properties of this algorithm? So that's what we want to do. We want to develop machinery to be able to argue this, because now we are outside the comfort of the Boolean world, so we have to develop something else. And so we have to use a different capacity measure. So VC dimension will not work. We'll focus on rather macro complexity. But I want to sort of make a, uh, make a note that there's actually any number of capacity measures that are used, and indeed several of them can be used. So things like pseudo dimension, fat shattering dimension, and so on. And so I'm going to focus on rather macro complexity, but there's a large number of capaci different capacity measures that can be used. Um, and we're going to require some boundedness assumptions on both the data and the functions that we're trying to fit. So, okay, so I'm going to 
talk about rather macro complexity, so it's a good point to pause a bit and ask see if there's any questions. Why couldn't we apply the formulation? Which formula? Uh, okay, so that's that's only for Boolean functions. So that's so it's given by the VC. So the D there is the VC dimension of the class of functions, which you can only define for Boolean functions. So now our functions are no longer Boolean. So we want to come up with a similar formula with use, replacing the VC dimension by something else, which is what we're going to do. Yeah. No, it, it, it will, it will in this case. So for, for binary classification, if you look at, there's only one meaningful loss function because you know, your loss, loss is either one or zero. You cannot have any other meaningful notion of loss. So, so this is why it doesn't, but because there is essentially only one loss function for binary classification. Once we start looking at real valued functions, you'll have lots of losses and it will indeed depend on the loss. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so let me define rather macro complexity. And I want to try to sort of make it slightly more abstract so because we will apply this notion to several different functions, not just to the class of function that we're trying to look at, learn, but also precisely to if we compose a loss function with the classes of function that we're trying to learn. And this is why I want to keep this a bit general. Um, so let Z be some set and you look at a class of functions from Z to interval AB in, in, on the real line. And S is going to be a fixed sample from a subset of Z of size M. So, so far, I'm not even bringing any distribution on Z, but soon we will come up with a distribution. For now, just think of S as a subset, even a multiset. So you can have repetitions of size M in this. And okay, so we'll define the empirical rather macro complexity. So there's a lot of text there, so I'll pass it slowly. Uh, of G with respect to this set S as the following. So we're going to introduce these quantities sigma, where sigma so sigma is a vector of sigma one through sigma m. Each of them is a minus one one valued random variable. They're all independent. So they take values minus one or one with equal probability. And and now so that's sigma, and these are called rather macro random variables. And what we're looking at is the empirical rather macro complexity is the expectation with all possible sigmas of this quantity inside, which is the supremum of, so you find the best G in, in this class of function that correlates with these minus one, one valued random variables, okay? Okay, so it's, I'll leave this for a second because it's not, but let me ask you, to think about two questions while we're doing that. So let's go back to our Boolean world. So, so Boolean world for me, everything is minus one, one, not zero, one. So suppose G is a set of Boolean functions, so it takes values minus one, one, and S is a set that's shattered by the class G. What's going to be the empirical rather macro complexity? Yes. You can find a, a, a function which ha matches the values. Yes. So then you get basically the supremum will always be one, and then you take the expectation. Uh, right. So it will always be one, one divided by m, and then you take the expectation over that, and then it sort of works out. Right, so you're right, so, okay, so, so you're almost right. So, you're, so, the, so the sum there it becomes exactly m, so m divided by m is one, and you're just taking expectation of one. So it's actually one, not two to the m. But yeah, so you always get one. So in fact, that's going to be, so that's, if s is shattered, this is going to be one, and that's actually going to be a very high Radom empirical Radom complexity. It means that this set of function g is rich enough to explain almost everything, right? So, so, so what we're generating is essentially random noise. And if you can correlate very well with random noise, it means you have a very, very large class of functions. You can represent random noise. So, so let's look at the other extreme. So if G only consists, so again, we're still in the Boolean world, but G only contains the constant one and minus one functions. So what's the empirical rather macro complexity then? Uh, 
Um, it's not quite zero, um, but... So, okay, so G consists of only two functions, the constant one and constant minus one function. So what's the empirical Rademacher complexity? Um, so this one is okay, there's a sub over G, so it's not exactly it. Okay, so, so, so it's roughly one over square root of M, so calculating it exactly is a bit tricky, but so, so if you think of this, right, so if you look at all of the sigma is there, you know, almost so surely the difference between the positives and the negatives, if you generate them randomly, is going to be roughly like square root of m. And so depending on whether there's more positives or negative, you choose the plus one or minus one. And so then you get, you will always get something like one over square root of m there. So take an expectation, you get one over square root of m. So, so that's in the sense of, so, so a very simple class of functions has Rademacher complexity, like one over square root of m whereas a rich class has, has Rademacher complexity one. And, and that's the range that we are going to be looking at. Right? So one over square root of m means it's going to be very easy to generalize because it's a very simple class of functions, whereas constant or one is going to be bad. This means your function class is too rich, it can express noise. Okay. So, that's, so that's, that's the motivation for looking at a term like this. Okay. Does, that, does that make sense? Because this is important, so I want to make sure that Okay, so, so that's our notion of empirical Rademacher complexity. Uh, the Rademacher complexity then is not that hard to define. You simply define the expectation of the empirical Rademacher complexity when you draw this set from some, some distribution D over, of size M from this distribution, right? So for any fixed M, you can draw a set of size M from this distribution, IID, and then you get this quantity and this Rademacher subscript with M of G is simply the expectation over all such subsets for the empirical Rademacher complexity of this. Okay. And so, so, the, so the empirical Rademacher complexity is, is not worst case in the sense it uses distributional information. So unlike so, so this VC dimension, which really looks at just any possible set of points, uh, doesn't really take the distribution into account, the same is true for the empirical Rademacher complexity, but when you look at the Rademacher complexity, if your distribution happens to be nice, then maybe you're, you know, there might be some sets which have very bad empirical Rademacher complexity, but your Rademacher complexity might still be all right, and that's kind of, okay. okay. Uh, incidentally, you can also have a more distribution version of VC dimension. I don't know if you covered that, but no, okay. Okay, so here's our Rademacher complexity. And we would like to have a theorem, otherwise we wouldn't want to define a concept like that. And so here's the theorem. So again, it's a bit, there's a lot of words there, so let's pass it. Um, so what, so G is this class of functions mapping Z. I'm, I'm going to use the interval zero, one instead of A, B. It's really just an issue of scaling if it's not of length one. And you'd get some sample S of size M drawn from some distribution over Z. And, and for every, positive delta with at least one minus delta probability for any G in G, the following holds. And that's the kind of result what we, wa what we want, right? So if you look at the expectation of G where Z is drawn from this distribution, it's close to its empirical expectation. So if you just look at the expectation of G of Z on the sample that you draw, plus some terms, whereas the second term is, is the Rademacher complexity of this. And then some term that again decays is roughly one over square root of m. So there's a log one over delta there, but essentially it decays as one over square root of m. Right, so the best we could hope for for the Rademacher complexity is to also decay as one over square root of m, because that's what the last term decays as. But even if it decays with m, that's, that's okay. But constant is not okay, because then you're always gonna have a constant error in this estimation. So that's, so we want, so as m increases, we want this Rademacher complexity to go to zero for learning to be possible. Okay. okay. Um, all right, so I'll just introduce this notation because this will come up a lot and I don't, didn't want to keep on writing this summation everywhere. So, so I'll use this expectation hat of Z drawn uniformly from some set S G of Z to simply mean the empirical average of G of Z in those, for ZI in this set. Uh, I will do a full proof of this theorem. It's not actually that hard, well, if you use the correct inequalities. Um, but let's first apply this to 
um, linear regression and see what we get. So, so our instance space X is um, some subset of Rn, and now I'm going to need some conditions on this instance space. So I'm going to assume that every vector X in this is bounded uh, in the two norm, let's say, by some X, a big X. The target values that I see are also bounded in some interval minus MM, so they can't be unbounded on the real line. And again, I'm looking at the class of functions, or linear functions, but again, the W in the linear functions, all of them have to have a bounded L2 norm by, given by capital W. Okay. So we want to compute, let's, the Radomacher complexity first of, of the set F, so the set of linear functions. So let's take some set S of size M and, and write down the definitions. I've pulled out one over M outside. That's just the definition of the empirical Radomacher complexity of, of this S. And what do we get? Well, the first thing to notice is that we can we've pulled W out of the summation because it's always there in all of the inner products. And so we have this W dot, the sum of sigma i times xi, and we're looking over to find the best such w in our set. So what is the best such w? Okay, so it's so basically something that points exactly in the direction of that sum. Right, so if you want to maximize the inner product, what you want to do is just find something that's ex exactly aligned with the vector you're trying to maximize your inner product with, and then increase the norm as much as you can. And so that gives us this big W uh, pulled outside because we're going to give that vector that norm and we take the vector that's aligned exactly in the direction as the sum of the sigma i xi. And so we're, what we're left with is simply the two norm of sigma i xi. Okay, so, it's, so it's really just the equality condition of cauchy schwarz in case you're trying that's all. That's, okay. okay, so let's start there. So that's what we have so far. Um, and then we're again going to apply a couple of elementary inequalities. So first we'll use instance inequality, or just arithmetic mean being less than root mean square, I suppose, whatever you call it. And, but then, it, then we can actually compute that expectation a lot more easily because now we have a squared norm inside. And these sigmas are all independent and take minus one and one with equal probability. So all of these things, the cross terms, all vanish is simply left with the sum of sigma i squared, which are all one, and the squared norm of the x's. And with a little bit more work, you can show that this is just wx divided by square root of m. So there's really nothing hard in doing these calculations. It's really just using inequalities that all of us know and, and using them at the right places to get the span. Right? And and in some sense, that's satisfying because this, there is this issue of scale, right? So once we're looking at real, real valued functions and not Boolean functions, somehow scale should matter in terms of complexity measures. And the, scale, the relevant scale here is how large can w dot x be? And since all the vectors x are bounded in two norm by, by big X and all the vectors w are bounded by big w, w, w times x really is the right scale. And you'd get that divided by square root of m, which is what you would hope for in terms of the macro complexity of this. Okay. Good, so we're, we're making good progress with proving this result, but okay, so we don't really just want to apply this result to linear functions, but we want to apply it to the risk. And so we, we want to make, we have to do a little bit more work. And so we want to compose the loss function with the linear function. And for that, we will make use of a lemma of Talacron, which is, uh, I won't prove this, but I'll just state this. So Talacron's lemma says, so if you look at any, uh, so the phi should all be the same. There's a var phi there and the phi here. Sorry about that. Um, so you take some class of functions z from a to b and phi from a, b to r is just a univariate L Lipschitz function. Then if you compose any, every function in G with phi and you look at the Radomacher complexity of the new class, all you get is you bounded by L times the Radomacher complexity of G. Right, so, this, so composing with a Lipschitz function just gets this Lipschitz constant, additional Lipschitz constant in the Radomacher complexity. That's what Talagron's lemma gives us. And that's, that will basically allow us to complete the proof and give generalization bounds for linear regression. So the class of functions we look at is 
is this. So we want to look at xy mapping to f of x minus y whole squared, where x is in the input space, y is in the target, and f is one of these linear functions. Right? So we're looking at all possible uh, f in this. Each of them defines this map. And consider phi, which is from m plus, OK, in this, in this interval. And the reason for this interval is not, again, a mystery, really, because the largest possible value of f of x is w times x. And the largest possible value of fx minus y is w times x plus m, because that's, they're bounded all of those in that interval. So, so we want to be able to apply the squared function to that. And as long as you have a quadratic function on a bounded interval, it has a fixed Lipschitz constant, right? So over, over R, there is no Lipschitz constant you can define for the quadratic function, but as long as you're living in a bounded interval, it's fine. And that's what you get as this Lipschitz constant, which together with using that for any constant function, it's random marker complexity simply m over square root of m. And this, this simple fact, which maybe you should try to prove as an exercise just to make sure you uh, you get what rather macro complexity is defined to show that if you look at f plus g, so you just add all possible pairs of functions from f and g, then you get this relation between the empirical rather macro complexities. You get that this rather macro complexity can be bounded by well things that depend on all of these bounds on x, y, and w, but the crucial thing is that you get square root of m in the denominator, right? which means that you know, assuming everything else is fixed, as, as you get more data. You are, going to, you are going to get a good guarantee on the generalization error. So that's, what, that's the square root of m in the denominator is what you should be looking up for. Okay. okay, so I went a bit fast on this, but hopefully it was made sense enough to at least see what's going on and what are the ideas going to compute. Yes? Yeah, this is um, still an upper bound, so presumably there could still be cases where um, getting more data doesn't because uh, the actual value of R doesn't change. Well, as long as R is bounded by something that decays with M, it means that our, our bound does decay with M, right? So, it's, so that's okay. It doesn't prove a low. It doesn't show that directly that you do need more data. I agree that. But, but there, is also, there are lower bounds that showing that you actually do need data as much as a rather macro complexity. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so this is, this is only going to give you a bound on the generalization error. So it's the difference between the error on your training set and that error on you. So if you have a lot of noise, you're going to see a lot of error in the training set and a lot of error on, on, under the distribution. But the difference is not going to be that large. That's what this is saying. Okay. Yes? So you told us consequences of Telegram Grammar, but did you actually tell us Telegram Grammar? Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, this is uh, well, I don't say exactly what it is, but this is what this is what we needed for. These are consequences. Yes, these are consequences. So what's the actual number? Is it a concentration inequality of some kind? Uh, actually, this is what is how it's stated, at least in the learning theory literature. I, I, I'm sure there is a more general version in the probability theory world. But, um, do you know Ben? Uh, the top of your head. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah. So. Right. Okay. And okay. So if you, so it's easy to actually bound the the rather macro complexity. So empirical rather macro complexity is always a bound. As long as you can prove it for any set S, then that's always going to be a bound on on the actual rather macro complexity. And we've made no assumptions on the set S so far, apart from its size. And that's that means that the rather macro complexity for parameter m is decays as one over square root of m, which proves what we need. OK, so, so that's, that shows that if we can perform empirical risk minimization, uh, then we get generalization using rather macro complexity bounds. Uh, it does, still doesn't tell us whether we can do an empirical risk minimization. In this case, in the case of linear regression, it turns out that we actually can. And it's worth spending a little bit of time. I won't spend too much time on this. But what is the optimization problem that we are trying to solve? So here's our empirical risk, which I've called J of W for some reason. Uh, may need to keep it in the optimization framework, I think. Um, and what we're really looking for is 
to find a W hat that minimizes J of W subject to the constraint that it's the norm of W is bounded by, by capital W. Okay, so how do you solve this problem? Well, okay, so if, there's, if I didn't have this constraint on the norm, it's actually very easy, and you can have a closed form solution for this, for this optimization problem. Uh, with the constraint, it's not, it's not too hard still, but you, can, you have to resort to some kind of convex optimization technique, so you can use gradient descent, so cast a gradient descent proje with projections onto this set. So you always want to project so that the norm of the vector you have at any point is at most bounded by W. Uh, and these, these algorithms are guaranteed to find a near optimal solution. And so the reason why I wanted to talk a little bit about optimization is again to make this point that in, in the learning world, in machine learning more generally, it's, it's often enough to use not very fancy optimization algorithms, right? So gradient descent based algorithms are not great in the sense that their dependence on epsilon is polynomial in one over epsilon, not polynomial in log one over epsilon. But ultimately you're gonna get a large error term because of the generalization bound anyway. So there's not much point in minimizing your empirical risk to something below the epsilon that you're gonna get from the generalization bound. So often it's actually enough to get reasonably optimal solutions for the empirical risk. And these algorithms are much faster than you know, doing more complicated uh, convex optimization problems. So, so these, are, uh, these are the kinds of algorithms that are always actually used in practice, even for, uh, certainly for more complex models, but even for things like linear regression, it's perfectly fine to just use gradient descent. And here's briefly what the algorithm does. So there's some parameter eta which decides the step size and the algorithm really just takes the gradient, follows it, um, but you might, f the reason why you need this extra projection step is because after you follow the gradient, your norm might be larger than, than the bound you have. So you project it back so that you're back into the feasible set and you output, in this case, the, the average of all of the iterates that you got as steps one to t. And so this is our projection operator, so we're simply reducing the norm and so this is an informal version of the kind of theorems that you get, which is that if you have a bound on your set of feasible things that you're looking at, and the gradients of your loss functions are always going to remain bounded, then you don't need that many steps. You actually get error that decays as roughly one over square root of t. So the square root of t is the number of steps that you have to run this gradient out. Gradient descent for, so again, T equals one over epsilon square is enough if you want epsilon accuracy. Okay, um, I'll, I think I'll skip this in the interest of time and go back to actually proving the main result on, on rather macro complexity, which is sort of the main thing we would want. So, so what is it that we are trying to prove? Uh, so we have this class of functions mapping z to zero one. Uh, d is some distribution over over z, and we have this. Uh, we get a sample size drawn from d, and we want to prove that for any delta with probability at least one minus delta for every g, the following result holds. Okay, so that's so. We'll, okay, so what's um, going to be a strategy? So we will use a concentration of measure inequality, so McDermott's inequality in particular which is the following. And again, it, there's a lot of text there, so I'll just pass it slowly. So, so Z is some, some set, and you have a function F that's defined from uh, Z to the M to R. So it's a M variate function such that for any I, there's always some CI such that for any possible value Z1 through ZM and ZI prime, uh, you have this thing here. So you apply f through z1 through zm, and you apply f only by replacing zi by zi prime. So everything else remains unchanged, and then the difference between this can be bounded by ci. Okay, so, so if you think about this, what this is really saying is that there's, it's bounding the influence of any individual variable on this m variate, m -variate function. Right? So, so if you just flip one variable, you can't change the function value too much. And, and this is already enough to give you very good concentration, right? So, so sort of the easiest case would be when all of these are 
you'll apply this to independent things and this will simply be the sum of the random variables, which is what will give you things like Chernoff bounds. But, but you can get much, these kinds of bounds for much more general things. So all you need really is that any single variable does not have too much influence on this function f. And as long as you can bound that, you will get, get an exponential concentration of this. And so, so provided you have such a function, then if z1 to zm are drawn iid, taking values in z from any distribution, then you have this, the, the probability of f being larger than its exponential expectation plus epsilon can be bounded by this x minus two epsilon square over something. And this is where the dependence on the ci shows up. And as long as these ci's are reasonable, you will get a good bound there. So that's, so it's a very powerful inequality and it will, it's actually used very widely in, in learning theory. And so we'll make use of this to prove our main result. So here's, what we will do. So let's start with a sample S, and I'm also going to make a sample S prime, which I won't use immediately, but uh, we, uh, we'll need an S prime, which are both drawn IID from, from the same distribution, so the samples of size M each. And we want to define the following function. So you take any set of size M, from, of subset of size M, define this function on this set, which is the supremum over all G in your class of functions, the expectation of G for a Z drawn from this distribution minus the empirical expectation for points in your set. Okay, so, okay, I'll pause just for a second to make sure that this is. Okay, so, so this shouldn't be completely surprising, right? Because this is what we would like to bound, right? So this, the, the term on the left is what we would like to bound by the term on the right plus some small things. So if this we can bound this quantity, then that's going to be, that's going to be what we essentially want. Okay? So what can we say about phi? So phi, we can think of phi as basically a m variate function. So if we, instead of using s, if we use this set s sub i, which is simply take s but replace the ith element by z i prime. And now we consider phi of s minus phi of s prime. What do we get? Um, and so this, the difference between these two subs in this case can be bounded really just by the difference between g of zi and g of zi prime. Okay. And, and then there's a one over m because of this uh, expectation in the, in the empirical estimation, it's essentially there's a one over m there, which is why you get one over m. And since g is in the interval zero, one, you just get this is bounded by one over m. Okay, okay I'll give you maybe a few seconds to think of why that's the correct bound. So it's an, it's an inequality on this. It's not very hard, but writing a complete proof would be a little bit annoying because of the soup. If it were a max, it would be easier, but it's, this is essentially what you get as a difference. Okay. Again, let me remind you what McDermott's inequality, again, which we want to apply directly, so we will use this. And this is essentially we're saying that we can use ci equals one over m for all of our i, right? So for every one of them, we're going to use exactly one over m. Um, this is what we have, which gives us this kind of a concentration. So we get that the probability that phi of s is larger than its expectation plus epsilon can be bounded by something that's exponentially small in m. So you get this minus two epsilon square m factor here. Okay. okay, so alternatively, we can flip this around and say that if for any delta with probability at least one minus delta, the following holds with phi of s is at most expectation of phi of s for s drawn from this, plus something that's order of log one over delta divided by n, you really just put delta there instead of this x and reversed the role of epsilon and delta. And so that's, that's good, that's starting to look like the kind of things that we want. <coughs> okay, so this is what we have proved so far. Um, 
So what we have, so if we just look at what FireFS is, so FireFS is super memorable all, all G. So in particular, we get that the prob for any delta with probability this one minus delta for every G, the following holds. Right? So this is just r saying exactly what phi is. And this empirical estimation is simply the uh, expectation had is simply the empirical expectation. And so we have this. What we want to show, which was the goal of our main theorem, which if we, uh, in case you have forgotten, was, is this. So we want to show that the expectation of G is bounded by this empirical estimation plus this order log one over delta squared, squared log one over delta over M term there. And in between, we want this two times, twice the Radomacher complexity of G. Okay, so we have something that looks almost like that, expect that except that this is this weird expectation. And you know, so what we want to hope for is somehow this expectation is nicely bounded by the Radomacher complexity of, of the G, right? So that's, if we could just show that the expectation of FireFS is at most twice the Radomacher complexity of G, then we'd be done. And let's prove that then it's, so this is when you have to sort of putting on your probability theory hats and think a bit creatively in how to get around this. So, so let's start with what the expectation of FireFS is. So it's the expectation of S drawn from this uh, D to the N of the supremum there. And you have another expectation inside again. So, so this is where a fresh sample S prime is going to be useful. So, so we want to introduce artificially this sample S prime inside this. So the expectation there can be replaced by this weird expectation where we first draw a sample from, from this distribution and then take the empirical expectation on that sample. But of course, the combined effect of that is exactly the same expectation as we had. So that's really not changing anything in this so far. Okay. And Again, if you've saw this proof of VC dimension, this, this also had the same doubling the sample trick. So this is commonly used in all of these inequalities. You ha at some point of time, you have to double the sample and use this trick somewhere to get these kinds of pounds. Right, so now we move the supremum inside the inner expectation. So we pull the expectation over S prime outside, and we get this quantity now, which starts to look a bit nicer. And so this is what we have. And now we want to, this is, what you, this is where we want to use the fact that S and S prime are exactly identically distributed. So we want to see that, well, we draw S and S prime, but we don't want to actually, so what we do is we draw two endpoints and we don't want to decide ahead of time which one would go to S, but S and S prime. We want to be able to swap points around between them. And this we can get by introducing these Radomacher random variables, okay? So if I put, so I can either put zi in s or zi in s prime and zi prime in s, and I don't want to decide what I'm going to do ahead of time. And instead I let that be controlled by this Radomacher random variable sigma i, which takes uniformly the value minus one. one. Now if it were in s, um, if z, if this were in I, s, sorry, okay. If zi were in s and zi prime were in s prime, then, then I'm fine, I would just want that with sine plus one, and if it were the opposite, I would want the same quantity, but with sign minus one, because then the first thing would contribute to the second expectation, and the second would compute, co contribute towards the first expectation. Okay, so this is when I'll pause and let you see if you believe this, because this is... So because S and S prime are identically distributed, it doesn't matter which one I put in which. And that's the same as saying that, well, I could pick the sigma to be randomly minus one or one, and I can introduce the sigma inside this. Uh, sorry, there should be a sum in both of those things which is missing. Uh, right. Uh, once we have that, then that's actually nice because, well, sigma is exactly what we want for our Radomacher complexity, right? So, so there's a difference of two terms there, and we can, we can just get a two outside and upper bounded by just one of them. They're identically distributed anyway. So we have this, if 
assuming that there was a sigma here and here, that's exactly the Rademacher complexity that we want. Okay, is that... Does that make sense? Okay, that's... That really completes the proof because we wanted to buy, have this expectation bounded by the random micro complexity. Okay, so let me come to the theorem statement again. Um, just to try and so this is this is what we have. So so now we can as long as we can bound the random micro complexity of not just a cl class of function that we're fitting, but the loss composed with that. And as long as you're we're using losses that are bounded and Lipschitz, and this is partly why we need to use bounded and Lipschitz losses so often in, in machine learning, then, then composing with the loss function is fine because we will still get a bound in the Rademacher complexity and we will get uh, this kind of a result. Okay, so. Okay. Okay, so actually, if it's okay, I want to go back to talking a little bit about the generalized linear models now, because I think it would be, I, I'm not so bad on time as I thought, and uh, it's, there's something interesting going on with these generalized linear models. So, so, what, so, so we mentioned linear models, which was, we just had x mapping to w dot x, so what are generalized linear models? Uh, so there's like linear models, but there's, there's this extra univariate function which could be nonlinear. So x is now going to map to u of w dot x. Okay, so, so this is what the generalized linear model is. And so, there's, so in general, you can put conditions on u, so you can r remove some of these conditions or you can add others, but what's enough is u is bounded increasing and one Lipschitz for the, for the purposes of what I want to do. And if, Again, so in terms of neural networks, this is really, a GLM is a unit in the neural network. This is really all that's going on in a neural network. And, um, right. so, so you have a linear function, apply a nonlinear function on top of that. That's what every unit in, in the neural network does. And so this, in some sense, this is the simplest possible neural network. It has a single unit, right? And so we can ask, well, what about learning generalized linear models instead of linear models. And we can cons consider the same ERM problem as we did for linear models, which is to write out the empirical risk in terms of the squared loss and try and find something that minimizes the empirical risk, which is this, uh, find something again that has a bounded norm W that minimizes this loss. Uh, so we have two questions again. One is, one is algorithmic, and one is for, from the point of view of statistical complexity. Well, the first one is actually easy because we can bound the statistical complexity. The second one, I guess, the way in which I said it, because the Rademacher complexity can be bounded easily by everything we've seen so far. We've already bounded the Rademacher complexity of linear functions. Here we are simply composing this additional function, which is one Lipschitz, so that doesn't really change anything, so this U is assumed to be known in all of these models. Um, and so, it, so we can use the same analysis as we had earlier. What changes now is the optimization problem suddenly becomes hard, this is no longer convex. Okay. So that's, and in this particular case of generalized linear models, there is, there's a sort of a cute trick that can be helped to, to get around this problem. And that's what I want to, briefly talk about before we can take a break. So, so I want to construct a different cost function and to have a board, I do have a board. Okay, so maybe I'll give some intuition about what this cost function is doing. Um, so I'm gonna define this cost function gamma y prime y to be defined as follows. I'm gonna look at the integral from zero to u, u prime of, or u inverse of y prime of u of z minus y. Okay. So the question is why this loss? And I'll, well, there's, there's two answers to that question. Um, but okay, so u is strictly increasing and 
so you can take its inverse, it's well defined. So I can define this, this integral in this, this particular cost function. The good thing is that now this becomes, if I, if I use this loss instead of the squared loss, this becomes convex. Okay, so, so why is it that it becomes convex? Um, that's really because U is monotonic. And what shows up is, okay, so maybe I'll try to do this. Right, so this is the loss of the values. That's w dot x of if z minus y z. So what's the gradient of L with respect to w? Okay, so in this case it's just u of uh, w dot x minus y times x. Okay, uh, so just for reference, let me write on the side what's going on here. So if I use, did use the squared loss, what is the gradient here with respect to w? Uh, sorry, there's a u here, u of w dot x minus y. Right, so there's two of u of u w dot x minus y, which is fine. Uh, but then you get this u prime here. And then you get an x. So the only difference between here and here is that you don't get this annoying u prime here at all. Um, and you just get this, uh, which, is, which is great because once you take the second derivative here, uh, what you're really going to get is simply something that looks like, well, if you look at the Hessian, and I won't write it completely, but you really just get x, x transpose. Uh, possibly some multiplied by some u prime somewhere. But this u prime is positive because u is monotone. And, and that's what makes this, uh, that's what makes this convex. And so we can actually solve this convex optimization problem uh, on the other hand, this is not convex. Uh, you, can, uh, you can't see it directly from the derivatives easily, at least I can't, but, but there are, you can construct instances where this is non-convex. And the other thing which, again, if some of you have heard of, um, maybe, and this shows up, is this, this U prime actually is, is quite bad. Because if you think, and this again relates a little bit to what you would do in neural networks and things that you would have heard of, is because typically functions that you will use for U are things like sigmoid, u prime happens to be very close to zero. And this means that your gradients are very small. And this is sort of this gradient saturation problem that you get in neural networks because you're directly taking the gradients here. And this also somehow disappears when you do this. So actually, the gradients here are, are very, very good. Um, OK, so that's, that's good. So we have some convex function which we can actually optimize. Great. And the question, of course, is, well, does it mean anything? OK, so, so I just made up some kind of a loss function. And it, it doesn't actually tell me very much. Um, what, what one can show actually indeed is if we are again, if we go back to the realizable setting, so if we, in the absence of any um, assumptions, we can't really say very much. But if we assume that actually the expectation of y given x is indeed of the form u of w dot x, then the global minimizers of the squared error and of this funny loss are exactly the same. And, and in fact, approximate minimizers are also approximate minimizers of each other. So in fact, if you can approximately minimize this in the realizable setting, you're actually going to get an approximate minimizer of the squared loss. And, and this is also not that hard to show, but, um, but I won't, uh, it's, I'm, uh, since I didn't prepare it, I would I risk making an error, which I wouldn't want to do while I do it on the board. Um, it's, it's, it's really just understanding this integral, and this is where this one Lipschitzness comes up. So you get sort of this integral is going to be at least half the squared loss, essentially, is what you get. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I, if it's okay, I would like to take a break roughly at this point before starting SVN, but maybe I'll, since you did do a computational learning theory thing in the morning, I will let me point out a couple of other computational issues that come up with these GLMs. So you can ask what, what happens if you don't have this increasing thing, but just Lipschitz constraint. Um, this actually doesn't change very much the statistical complexity of the problem at all, because it's really the Lipschitz constant that determines the statistical complexity. 
But the computational complexity becomes, suddenly becomes vastly different even in the realizable setting or something like the realizable setting. Uh, and this relates to this problem called learning parities with noise, which have you heard of learning parities with, who, who has heard of learning parities with noise? Okay, so then maybe yeah, that didn't make much sense. So, okay, so let, uh, but I, I'm happy to talk about it in the break if anyone wants. And so, so, it's, so it's actually, so this nice thing that we could do if u is indeed increasing, uh, we can no longer do if it's not, if it's just Lipschitz. So, so the statistical complexity doesn't change very much if you just remove the increasing condition. The complex, com computational complexity vastly changes because we believe that there are no efficient algorithms for learning parity with noise and this would imply that. And so that's sort of, that's all I wanted to say about generalized linear models. And then after the, in the next session I'll talk about uh, SVMs, a bit about neural networks and algorithmic stability. Yes. What if U is not Sorry? What if U is not bounded to anything? Um, I, I would assume like radius. Right, so U. Can you repeat the question? Yes. So the question was what happens if U is not bounded? Um, so I don't think it changed. Okay, so, so typically we would assume that X is bounded and W is bounded. So, it's, so U. Is have, would have to be very weird if it's not bounded because it's defined on a bounded interval, and it's but actually if it's Lipschitz and on a bounded interval it can't really be unbounded. So, so you need some kind of boundedness assumption. So that's not really required. But it's, it would be implied by some bound on X and, and W, and and that one Lipschitz also actually can be traded off with the bound on W really. So if you have an L Lipschitz there, you can just allow the norm of W to be larger, and then that's really the same thing. So, that's, so there's, there's, a, there's a single scale for U and W. You can, if you want to keep U one Lipschitz, then you can just increase W, and that's the length of W, and that's perfectly fine. Yes? Yes. Yes, yes, so, 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 yeah, so, so you have some function of random variables and so, right, so you can look at the expectation of that function and you can look the actual, you can value of the function and you want to say, well, how likely is it that this function can deviate significantly from its expectation? And, and all these bounds are saying that actually this happens with a very, the probability of deviating significantly from the expectation is very, very small. So that's what all these concentration of measure phenomena are saying. And you, know, you get different rates depending on different, on the kind of functions that you use. In this case, for example, in McDermott says if you have, if you can bound the influence of any single variable well enough, then you actually get these very sharp exponential tails in, and things like that. But, you, you know, so in general, depending on what conditions you have, you could get different kinds of bounds, but that's, that's the general idea. How does a random variable do, how close is it should be to its expectation? Um, and can you give a bound on the probability that it's, it's going to be more than some distance away from its expectation. That's the general idea. Yes. Uh, 